Howdy, y'all. Welcome back. Imagine, if you will, a world that is just like ours, some would say parallel to ours, but it exists under the extreme conditions of almost constant freezing and ice. In our relatively recent history, as little as 400 years ago in some narratives, we have overwhelming proof of a mini ice age, one which reshaped the many cultures of the world which it ravaged. This extreme weather event may be the cataclysm that's referred to in the myths and legends of many ancient cultures, or a series of similar events could be those referred to in the ancient religious texts. By many accounts, the routine of this nature is cyclical. An age of growth, stunted by an age of ice, thawed into an age of mud, and from this, a deluge, we have the growth of a new culture until a similar event reshapes the history. This is a cyclical event. These are the tales we hear throughout the world, and yet we also have evidence of an importance that was placed upon, some would say a skill which was inherited by, certain people of the world during this mini Ice Age event. For centuries in the lands that are today Russia and the neighboring northern countries, we could find magnificent ice palaces, carriages and sleds, often pulled by reindeer and other creatures, the image of such painting a picture similar to some sort of ancient magic or alchemy. St. Nicholas Bay was what the English named Archangel, Russia's largest port city prior to the mini ice age. In St. Nick, the English who first landed described massive castles, some which seemed to incorporate or to be built out of the ice. It goes without saying, but it appears those in the once Tartarian region thrived in this cold and the initial mini ice age, however severe it actually was, did little to cease the advancement of these most Northern people. Fairy tale narratives of ice built palaces aside, the truth may actually be stranger than fiction and involve the melting of this ice. For example, we have Vikings who first intercepted what they perceived to be fallen angels in the port city that is today Archangel. Archangel said to be the location where Saint Michael himself disposed of the devil. Here, many scholars believe the Vikings intermingled with the people of this early Archangel city, creating the depiction of the large, blonde or red-haired Viking which we're so accustomed to today. Many depictions of earlier Vikings, however, appear much more Indo-Aryan. Digressing, as the mini ice age struck this point of Archangel, or rather, as the aftermath known as the Great Melt struck this area, this is around the same time that Peter the Great comes to power. He opens many new ports throughout Russia, diverting trade directly away from Archangel, which was a star fort up until the city was destroyed by fire. Now, I mention all of this because it appears that, at some point after the mini ice age, a similar tale to this one occurs worldwide. We have a power vacuum that's created, where new world powers were able to come to power to facilitate the history which we still read about today. Again, even things as simple and arbitrary as calendars and time were not in sync worldwide before this mini ice age. There was no semblance of unity between the histories of the world, making the deciphering of them as one unified world history nearly impossible. The one thing that we do have in nearly all cultures is the great deluge, the flood and the melt or the cataclysm, which seems to be an indicator for where exactly on the timeline we are sitting. Peter the Great and his future relatives would inherit the wonders of Grand Tartary just as the world would begin to inherit trade within the ports of Grand Tartary soon after. When the English reached St. Nicholas Bay, aka Archangel, discovering these massive ice palaces and Tartarian worship centers, this apparently led to numerous great gardens being constructed all around Europe in this Northern Russian design. We have them in the 16, the 17, the 1800s, and many of these gardens included such features as tartar tents or round towers. These structures today are considered to be follies that serve no purpose if they still stand at all. However, we also have things like the Great Ice House of Russia, an ice palace, for example, which is said to have been built in 1739 to celebrate the Russian victory over none other than the Ottoman Empire. By 1740, this ice palace had melted. Yet the ice house, a massive old world style castle-like home, went on to inspire numerous, I'd say over a thousand other ice palaces, which were documented and built throughout the Anglo-Saxon world. We have ice palaces in Europe, 
the United States, and countless in Canada, just to name a few. The original ice house of Russia stood over 80 feet long, said to be exactly 33 feet high, with an additional 23 feet below the surface. The ice palace of Russia is written to have stood for just one winter, yet it contained living quarters, a full dining room, a kitchen, ice cannons, a life-size elephant made out of ice, ice sculptures, and furthermore, I believe most revealing, it contained a human zoo. In this narrative, we're told over 300, quote, actors were contained in the zoo for the winter, actors taken from all around the world. It appears that the Ice Palace was treated like a world's fair, like a place to showcase the inheritance. Beyond Ice Palaces, we have ice caves, ice tunnels built for travel. But I believe the most interesting thing that I've discovered, and what I wanted to share with you in today's video, is the ice ship. We often don't allow our imaginations to contemplate ideas which would almost instantaneously be scolded by our contemporaries. Amongst the ice, and amongst these ideas, who knows where it truly began, we have the concept of ships literally crafted entirely out of ice. It seems unimaginable at first, but as we allow ourselves to picture this process, how cost effective could it truly be? One of the most abundant and available resources on earth converted into a mode of transportation. How practical. During the Second World War, the British military hatched a top secret mission known as Project Habakkuk, which intended to create a massive ship, an aircraft carrier, some would say a floating island, which would not only be the largest ship ever constructed in the history of mankind, but it was also planned to be created almost entirely out of ice. The project was first conceived in the late 1930s by a man named Jeffrey Pike, who was an engineer for the Combined Operation Headquarters of Britain. The plan was to create the largest ship in the history of the world, which would primarily stay in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, but it could be moved worldwide to help refuel and station aircraft. The catch? It was to be built entirely out of ice, more specifically out of Pycrete. Pycrete is a blend of 86% ice and 14% sawdust, or a ratio of 6 to 1. Pycrete, according to multiple accounts, was significantly stronger than concrete. At secret meetings held at the Smithfield Meat Market in London, Tests on Pycrete revealed it could withstand the strongest and fastest bullets with little more than a scratch, where common ice shattered instantaneously. These findings were shown to Lord Mountbatten, who in return showed them to Winston Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt at the 1943 Quebec Conference. Here, Mountbatten mimicked the earlier test of strength, firing upon first the standard block of ice, which shattered and second upon the block of Pycrete. The Pycrete repelled the projectile, which proceeded to bounce around the room, nearly striking a few important individuals along the way. After this successful test, Project Habakkuk was put into full forward motion, and the secret project here leaves us with so many questions. First, where did this technology come from? Is it really as simple as adding 14% wood pulp to 86% ice? And if so, could this really create a nearly indestructible material that will float perfectly? Could we mimic this operation today? The aircraft carrier made of ice, made of pycrete, was said to be created to sit in the mid-Atlantic Ocean for use by the Allies. This ice ship was to be over 600 meters long, or nearly 2,000 feet. For reference, the largest naval ship ever built to this day is 342 meters long. This ice ship was estimated to be made at roughly 1% the price of creating a similar steel ship. The ice ship was to be housed in a hollowed out iceberg. The name Habakkuk refers to the Bible verse Habakkuk 1.5, and I quote, Behold ye, among the heathen, 
and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told to ye. End quote. This ice carrier had a fully functional, operational miniature which was created and tested at Patricia Lake, Alberta, Canada. Worth note here, we're told this fully functional model was able to be kept frozen simply by a one horsepower motor and the entire craft was created by conscientious objectors who worked on the alternate energy sources for the crown. That is absolutely fascinating to me. After this fully functional model was constructed and tested, the full size model was then ordered, which was said to include 300,000 tons of wood pulp, 25,000 tons of fiberboard, 10,000 tons of steel, and 35,000 tons of wood. At this point, Project Habakkuk also lost its creator, Jeffrey Pike, the one who first envisioned this massive ice ship, and the one who developed the Pycrete for which it was created. It was also named after him. He was removed from this project, apparently, because of the Americans. This seems to be plausible deniability, however, because from here we're told this project proceeded forward without Pike, and the working project was to be put in the sea by 1944. However, this never happened. At some point after Pike left, but before 1944, the joint panel of the Americans and the British apparently decided that this huge ice ship to be the largest ship in the history of mankind, which was nearly completed, needed additional features before it would be launched into naval use. First, the Americans requested that the ship could travel 7,000 miles without refueling. Second, the joint force decided the ship, again, nearly 2,000 feet long, would need to be able to withstand the largest waves in recorded history. Third, the admirals decided the ship must also be torpedo-proof or able to withstand the strongest known torpedoes at the time, meaning that the ice walls would need to be reinforced with steel and they would need to be over 40 feet thick. Fourth, the Americans apparently wanted to use alternating motors to give the ice ship the ability to control direction. The Royal Navy of Britain, however, would not move forward unless the ice ship was powered by massive rudders, a renovation on the design which would be nearly impossible to implement. All of these changes combined to create a nearly impossible timetable for the completion of the ice ship by the year 1944. As more and more delays were reached, according to this currently accepted narrative, we're told that the ice ship, a ship which was to be the largest ship in the entire world, literally made of 86% frozen water, was apparently too expensive to complete. That's right, we're told the frozen water simply became too costly and the Navy decided to just build ships out of manufactured steel instead. I simply cannot explain this. Essentially, the whole idea of building an ice ship of any kind was tucked under the rug after 1944. And the idea itself really isn't something that I've ever heard anyone else discuss. It's an astounding, ingenious design. If taken serious, we can imagine how cost-effective these ships could really be. Yet we're told the project was canceled because the water, the frozen water, and the design, the manufacturing process became too expensive? How can we explain that? Are ice ships an invention of modern men, of the men of the early 1900s? Or are ice ships an inherited tech, antiqua tech, that thrived during and after the mini ice age? Could ice palaces ice walls, the creations from our fictional fairy tales, could the evidence coming forward point us towards a narrative that reaches far beyond the normal stretches of what we see as acceptable science? Ice walls, hidden ice cities, hidden Antarctica, hidden North Pole, the Black Rock, Project High Jump, Admiral Byrd, the ice palaces of Russia, of Europe, of America, white-haired ice-living people, secret Arctic people described throughout history. And then we turn back to Tartary, 
we see ice travel by reindeer. Compare St. Nicholas. Compare Archangel. Pagan traditions of Russia becoming the modern traditions of today. Russian history after this great deluge is the great thawing, the great flood. What fascinates you the most about this narrative? And could we, as a society, build ice ships today? Would it work? Let me know everything you feel in the comment section down below.